I'm going to take a moment to prepare you today for the format of today's summit. We're going to hear two presentations today, and after each presentation, you will be led through a conversation that my company has created by interviewing each presenter. And then you'll reflect on what you've learned in the, in the presentation and apply that in the conversation. Each question that we created will set you up to consider actions and initiatives that take you back to your community. Tomorrow, after our final presentation and conversation, we'll give, give each team a chance to share three actions that they'd like to take back with them. Um, and there's a place in your notebook to take notes, so I'm encouraging you all now to take notes. This is a homework assignment. <laughs> So that's what's going to happen. You'll see the conversation cards are on the table. Please feel free to take them back with you to reflect upon. The conversations are also in the workbook in case you need to read them. I'm a visual person. I have to read it. I can't have it talk to me. So it's there for you. Okay. So without further ado, I am pleased to present Emily Rubin, whose presentation, Language is a Missing Link and Missed Opportunity. Emily Rubin is the Director of Communication Crossroads Incorporated in Atlanta, Georgia. She is a speech language pathologist specializing in the relationship between social and emotional engagement and learning. As a former adjunct faculty member and lecturer at Yale University, she has served as a member of their Autism and Developmental Disabilities Clinic and participated in multiple multidisciplinary research focused on social and emotional neurodevelopment. She is a co-developer of the Social Emotional Engagement Knowledge and Skills, SEES, which you'll find inside the workbook, Professional Learning Approach, which provides freely accessible tools for measuring learner engagement and enhancing engagement in natural contexts. Emily is also the co-author of SIRTS, a criterion reference assessment tool and framework for social and emotional development. She lectures internationally and provides consultation to education, healthcare, and child welfare systems to support social and emotional engagement, learning, and development in university settings. It is my honor to introduce Emily Rubin.
We need to change something out there. We need to recognize that language is a well-being indicator. And in order to do that, we need to change what we currently do. We use a lot of reactive approaches in which we intervene when we see academic failures and we intervene when we see that behavioral challenges. We often intervene when there's poor mental health. What we hope to propose today is a new approach, a systematic proactive approach, where let's go ahead and proactively let everyone know that interacts with children, that we need to create engaging environments from infancy to adolescence so that we can promote engagement because engagement is a fuel for language and language is a beacon for universally positive outcomes. If it is such a beacon, why has it been missed? Um, that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit today. We go. Oh, did you not have my title slide up the whole time? I'm so sorry. <laughs> really pretty title slide, too. <laughs> Compliments of, of Dr. Ariane Weldon and Dr. Mary McGivney, who couldn't be here today, but both of them are active collaborators in this particular project, as has been the Central Savannah. Um, River Area Recent, Dr. Debbie Alexander, who's here, um, and some of the other teammates that I have, I'll be calling out with you in just a moment. Um, so the, there's this toolkit that I want to share with you today. And in this toolkit, we ask ourselves three questions. Why, what, and how? Why do we need to think about the language development as a well-being indicator? Similar to like how you can screen for vision and hearing and oral health. We need to be understanding what language development we should be expecting for children across developmental stages. We need to talk about the why language development is so absolutely critical. Then we need to talk about what are we going to do about it? How can we use engagement as a gauge of whether or not children are developing their language as we would expect? And find opportunities where we need to enrich our environments to promote stronger language development. That's the what of this. Then we're going to talk how we can change our practices and policies to be more proactive. Reacting to academic failure, reacting to behavioral challenges and poor mental health is a system that's never going to work. We need to back that up and proactively support children and their families, early childhood and can hit start programs. We need to build that resilience all the way through when we think about language. So let's start with the why. I'll stop looking behind me. Sorry, there is a very tiny screen up there I can look up. So <laughs> that's my screen up there. <laughs> my glasses are not good. Um, let's talk about why. Why is language so important? You know, I did choose to be a speech and language pathologist on purpose, and this quote really has guided all of my work. If all of my possessions were taken from me with one exception, I would choose to keep the power of communication for by for by ensuing that we regain the rest. It is through communicative exchanges that we build relationships, that we understand about the world, that we gain our knowledge and gain our resilience. Language, in fact, is a vehicle by which children communicate their needs and ideas, develop and maintain relationships with those around them, and solidify an understanding of the world. This is an image captured courtesy of Emmanuel Hurley that Start Program in Mount Emmanuel County, hot off the presses. This is a uh, teacher named Jack and her, and her kiddos. And you're going to get to meet these kids in just a moment. As you can see, they are developing their language skills and their resilience. I can't wait to show you them. The ability to communicate is foundational to the social, emotional, and academic success of our children. What is less known is that those communicative exchanges, those back and forth, serve and volley, that engagement, is in fact the fuel for healthy brain development. Brains develop as a result of those communicative exchanges with caregivers, educators, and peers. Engagement, in fact, is the fuel for learning. For those of you who have seen me present before, you know that I can geek out on neuroscience all day. So when you told me I have two extra minutes, I was like, oh yeah, I could talk about neuroscience all day here. Um, but I'll try not to. <laughs> it just fascinates me that the back and forth exchanges that we have with each other is actually the fuel for our brain development. And it is absolutely essential for our young children to grow up healthy, to develop language, literacy, and then ultimately social emotional resilience. The first phase of this brain development, which many of us refer to as attachment, is basically helping our children learn to feel safe and connected in the social world. It is in those early childhood experiences with their caregivers, their back.
back and forth interactions with those in their family members, but also early childhood educators, where children begin to form those connections that are literally growing their brain. When children are born, they're born with different genetic predispositions, but many children are born with a genetic predisposition toward people. And when you are born with that disposition, you're engaging with people, you get a release of a bunch of neuroendorphins in your brain. And one of those neuroendorphins is called dopamine. You don't have to be a child in the 1970s to so you know what dopamine is, right? <laughs> <laughs> dopamine is just dope, you know? It's this, this neuroendorphin that just makes you feel like high, essentially. It makes you crave what you're getting. This is the natural form of dopamine. It says, get more of this, want more of this. That is what's genetically released in a child's brain. Another thing that's released is a natural form of opioids, the good kind, the kind that we internally degenerate. And those are very positive. They spark the brain, they turn it on, they get it ready to learn. But there's something even more important that is chemically exchanged between a child and their caregivers that grows the brain. It's a hormone called oxytocin. All of you know that's my favorite hormone, right? <laughs> um, oxytocin is this really cool hormone that we all produce in our bodies, and that it does something kind of neat. It's a pheromone that floats through the air, and as it floats through the air, it serves as an attractant. So imagine you're a caregiver sending off an attractant to your child who's already getting a little dopamine and opioids, right? But oxytocin does something even more remarkable. It breaks through the blood-brain barrier, serves on top of that dopamine and opioid, creating what neurologists call an oxytocin mixed cocktail from heaven. Um, it's this elixir that says turn on the brain and get rolling. But oxytocin is also nicknamed the brain-building hormone because it's necessary for growing brain matter in our young children. Children will not grow their brains in the isolation of social engagement. They will have significant intellectual challenges if they don't have a back and forth interaction. So we need to give them that oxytocin that gives them that, it's a feeling of safety, connectedness, and attachment. And what that is teaching them is that communication exchanges are really the elixir for brain development and for ultimate success in language, literacy, and academic uh, success. As you see here with this um, particular mother and her child right here, I watch this not just thinking that this looks joyful and amazing and fun, I'm literally watching that child grow. the road. Um, and I see the chemical sparking the child and helping them recognize the importance of communication. What we're fueling right there is something called the social brain. The social brain is the subcortical region of the brain that reminds all children and all human beings to pay attention to people to listen to people, to follow role model actions, and to communicate back and forth and back and forth. This engagement fuels language development, and therefore, and ultimately, language fuels literacy and so forth. Why do children read, by the way? Children want to read because they, they want to hear what an author has to say. They're connected, they have relationships, they want to know what other people have to say. Why do children ultimately write? To communicate with other people. The foundation is connection, back and forth, communicative exchanges, and relationships. So as children form that social brain that says communicate with people, stay connected, go back and forth and back and forth, they move forward in their brain development, learning how to seek out social connections with words and language. Children learn important words, not just I acquired my first word, I'm ready to go. They learn people's names, they learn verbs, and then they learn how to say people's names, verbs, and nouns, subject, verb, noun. Why is that so important for the language development or for emotional resilience for all of what we do for in our lives? Well, the ability to talk about people and verbs and nouns actually provides a way of self-advocating. Children need to be able to ask for the person they need in their life, to be able to be comforted when they're stressed, to be able to engage when they're not, when they're not stimulated enough. They need to call out for that person. They need to ask for specific actions. And now, subject verb now is the basis of being able to talk about the present and the past and actually plan for one's future. It's non-negotiable for that inner language we need to be able to resili be resilient to cross situations and settings. If we don't have the language for people verb and noun, we will have challenging behaviors, we will have difficulty you know, moving into a range of novel situations and settings. As you can see in this particular image, this teacher recognizes that as she's reading to these young children, it looks as if the words are jumping off the page, and right into those children, she's really showing them that language is a means of connection and engagement. It flourishes the language regions of the brain. The next big shift of brain development beyond the social brain is actually building the language hemispheres. 
Once those language hemispheres form and children are able to talk about the present, the past, and the future, then we can talk about higher level brain development, where children learn how to succeed in a range of social situations, where they learn how to be a friend in the, you know, in the playground, a student in the classroom, to be able to manage their time effectively, to be able to cope with the challenges of teachers giving you poor grades, or students shutting you for whatever reason, to be able to cope with all that. You need resilience, you need self-advocacy language, you need to be able to have the executive functioning um, a brain development, that's the highest level of brain development. What is fueling all of that brain growth? Engagement. Engagement, that oxytocin cocktail, actually fuels social connection, building the social brain, it builds the language hemispheres, and ultimately literacy, resilience, and self-management. There's, a, there's a, a sentence under there that says something else. If engagement fuels language literacy and learning, we are all brain architects. We aren't just parents, and caregivers, and educators, and those that interact with children. We're actually providing the oxytocin to our children that is growing their brain matter, their architecture of their brain to play a significant role in healthy brain development. I want all parents who, of young children, I want all early childhood educators to realize the immense responsibility of that, but also the gift that we are actually playing a significant role in that child's future, just like the back and forth communication exchanges we have with them. Did you know that research demonstrates the most important predictor of third grade literacy and, and math outcomes is a child's language development at age five? Let's take that in for a moment. That is the best predictor of whether or not they're going to be you know, literate at third grade is their language development. Their math outcomes have a lot to do with their language skills as well. Did you also know that a recent study came out that showed 265,000 five-year-old children. It revealed that the children with the effective use of language and communication were 19 times more likely to have positive mental health than children without effective use of language and communication. Those statistics don't lie. 19 times, 20 times more likely, essentially, um, that you know, with large numbers of children to have positive mental health. Language and communication and mental health are inseparable. People have been talking a lot about addressing the poor mental health challenges that we're experiencing with our children right now. And I want to change the conversation. We need to address the fact that children are in need of language nutrition. They need back and forth exchanges, they need positive interactions to grow the language skills that are going to allow them to be resilient. Um, because right now they're disconnected and they're alone and that is not, not going to solve the problem. Language development is in fact a universal beacon of positive outcomes. When you look at all the research and the studies, it just keeps coming up. However, there's a problem. We don't tend to notice it. We don't tend to pay attention to it until there's academic failure, until there's behavior challenges, until there's poor mental health. And so we need to think about how that is, is one of our current problems in the field. Prevalence. Is this really a significant challenge? Nationwide, whether or not there's a primary English language is English, at least 12% of children entering school do not convey the indicators of language development that you would expect for the age band that they're coming in, whether it's at three or five years of age. They're not meeting those expectations for language development. These are not necessarily children that have been identified as having speech and language disorders. This is just they're not kind of doing what we would expect a child at that chronological age to be able to do. This is significant, 12%, that's one in every 10 kids that's coming into our schools. What about in court connected children? Children who are, for example, in welfare, children who are in the juvenile justice system. Two thirds of children and teens, and we're talking about infants, quite honestly, about a significant portion of court connected children right now are below the age of five. 40 to 50 percent of children in poor connected situations are infants and toddlers in the foster care system. In those systems, we can expect two out of three of them to have language developmental vulnerabilities. We need to be aware of this proactively. Let's not wait until they fail academically at five years of age or seven years of age. We need to start at birth. We need to start at infancy. Um, and really educating everyone what it's going to take to have this child develop language skills. That's more than five times the rate of experience in non-core experience for connected children. 
There's another factor in those four connected children and teens that we need to talk about. Research comparing pragmatic language skills, so this particular uh, pragmatic language refers to the ability to use language for the functions of social communication, calling out for someone when you need help, communicating for a range of different purposes, not just requesting an item, or commenting and sharing experiences to make relationships, the ability to use language for a variety of different functions in poor connected children, 44% of children who have significant needs around that have been neglected have significantly lower pragmatic language skills um, than more children who are not, not in those situations. These are pretty dramatic statistics that we need to kind of talk about. Why is this happening? I know that when I got, we are currently rolling out social emotional engagement work in Baldwin County, and that's a district that I'm, I'm very familiar with, Richmond County over here, CSRA teams. Um, and there's a lot of concern about social emotional well-being of children. Why is this happening? When children do not have inner language, the ability to talk about what's happening at the current moment, to say first we're doing this, then we're going to do this, and don't get to read the book I want to read right now, but next we're going to read it next, or first Sarah's going to go, then Joey's going to go. The ability to use language to sequence things, but then also to say, I'm feeling a little stressed right now. When I'm stressed, I can take a break. I can ask Sarah for a break. I can go here and I can do this. That language, that dialogue that we have in our children is what promotes resilience. Some of our children don't even know how to use people's names and verbs, never mind sequence the day through their minds and be able to talk through challenging situations like how to ask for a break or how to ask for support or comfort for the purposes of emotional regulation. Um, this is a, a kindergarten example right here. When I feel this way, I can. This is a reminder, a way that we can provide support for children. Just a reminder, they have language, use it. Use it for that purpose of their language. When children do not have those language uh, uh, capacities for social communication and emotional regulation, what do we often see? Inattention, defiance, cognitive problems, anger, a lack of willingness to engage, um, difficulties with language development are actually frequently misinterpreted and mischaracterized as different diagnoses, behavioral challenges, academic challenges, just simply defiant, um, oppositional, those kinds of uh, diagnoses come up. The failure to develop effective social communication jeopardizes that educational, mental health, and well-being outcomes. We know that. That's just been well established in the literature. There is something that is very hopeful. Language is the missing link. And it can be a well-being indicator if we put our minds to making this more proactive in our communities. So what can we do? Um, I just kind of shared a little bit about the why. Communication exchanges is the basis of brain development. Language plays a role not only in just being able to understand the world, but being able to cope and develop emotional regulation. What can we do about it? This quote really needs to be on your mind right now. <laughs> when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which the flower grows, not the flower, right? We don't want to fix the child when they have language difficulties. We don't want to deal with the academic failure of the poor mental health. We have got to change the environments that children are growing up in. We need to think about home engagement. We need to think about early childhood settings, school, community-based environments, are we creating the environment that flourishes language development? Especially in children that are more at risk, the toolkit will show you which ones are, like the poor connected children, foster care children, things of that nature. But really, every child on this planet needs an engaging language-rich environment. So what can be done? It's time to institute a new systematic approach to proactively engaging and enhancing language development. And we're talking, it says from birth through high school, but as I read that, I go, really from prenatal <laughs> um, all the way through. We, we really want to, to, to flourish all, all children as they are developing from you know, infancy all the way through transition to adulthood. It's a shift of mind and a shift of practice that I ask you to think about today. So when we think about the what portion of the toolkit, what is our goal? It's to educate all the interactive children that language is a well-being indicator, and we're going to do that by noticing language development from birth to high school, and then proactively monitoring the engagement level of children, as well as finding opportunities and when we can change those environments. 
So we're going to notice and monitor. Before we do things like screening and diagnosis and all of that, let's just notice the language development of our children. How are we going to do that? There's a tool, I believe this one is in your handout packet. I haven't had a chance to uh, float through. But it's definitely a freely accessible tool to download off the Get Georgia Reading and um, look it looks like it's like the last page of your booklet. It's actually two pages front and back. And you'll see that it starts from birth to six months and goes all the way to 12 to 18 years of age. This is a, a, a tool called the Language Development by Age Man. And it's not your typical milestone checklist that you might see as a child achieve, you know, two or three word combinations by this age, or are they using single words, or these kind of things. It's not like a milestone checklist. It's an indicator of language development that includes the wide functions of language. Is this child using language for the purpose of social communication? Do they use language not just to request objects, but to communicate for a variety of different functions? protesting activities, asking for comfort, sharing experiences, going back and forth in interactions. We want to look at that pragmatic language, or what we call social communication. And it's also going to look at the use of language for emotional regulation. Can children talk them through self um, certain situations? Um, some children at a very young age will learn the word no. That's a great word for emotional regulation. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Um, where then children learn first this, then this. Then children say, help, or I need mean, mommy, mommy help. But you start to learn to use language to self-advocate for your needs, to express your emotion, and to be able to build that language of uh, resilience, emotional resilience. So it looks at all of those different elements, but allows you to say, what if I have a child that's birthday eight to six months in front of me, what would I be expecting? Why is this tool helpful? Because it helps those that are noticing language development and the children that they support um, with how to be developmentally responsive. It helps you know what to look for and what to model and to engage with that child. So I want to put your work a little bit here by introducing you to a child who's absolutely captivating. Um, <laughs> this young lady I got to meet virtually through um, a, a recent pilot of this toolkit hosted by Central Savannah River Area Risa, the CSRA, and the Alexander's team, and funded by the Deal Center to pilot this toolkit out. We tried it out in the Manual County's Early Head Start program. And I got to meet this little girl. And I just, I, 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 she's going to be impacted for the rest of my life. Just look at her, right? Yeah. You're gonna, I'm going to show you a video of her in just a moment. And what we're going to try to do is notice her language. There's a trick here. She doesn't yet use words. She's about 16 months of age. She will use one new word because they're going to do the wheels on the bus song. And I think she's going to say, beep, beep, like you're going to beat the bus and you know, the horn on the bus. So that might be a ritualized word that you're going to hear her say. But language begins at birth. Language begins by children noticing the world around them, maybe use gestures for a variety of different functions and reasons, um, the ability to notice emotional expressions in others and mirror those emotions. There's all these aspects of language that we can start noticing between 12 and 18 months. You can also see the earlier age range between birth and six months. So let's take a look at our tool. If you have it open, if you can see it between 12 and 18 months, what is this child able to do? We're going to try to see, is this child responding to the, the vocalizations and engagement of her teacher? Is she pairing her gestures with sounds and vocalizations? Is she, if she go down on this, is she imitating the actions of the teacher, which is basically role modeling what's going on in the book? A lot of the things that you're going to notice are she's communicating for many different purposes. Not just, I need that book. It is what's happening in that book, let's share about that book. At some point, she's seeing there's an emotional situation here when the baby on the bus goes wham, wham, wham. She's very concerned about that. Um, <laughs> and that emotional, that emotionality, she's looking toward the person who's filming. She's also looking at the teacher, like, how am I supposed to cope with that? What can I do to get through this emotional situation? You can see that back and forth things by looking at all of these indicators. Take a look at this young lady and notice her language. And the bus stops and up you can, up you can. People on the road go up you can, all round the town. The the bus goes beep, beep, beep.
So that little moment, which is about a minute long, um, we can share all the different things that we noticed. And what I did with Emmanuel at the early head start is I said, let's look at each and every one of those and put a star on things that you're noticing. And really this experience, this opportunity is just to reflect, are we being developmentally responsive to this young lady given her 12 to 16 month age band at this point? And then turn around so you can actually read it. And you can see right there, the star is about to go on responding to others by looking pairing gestures and vocalizations and words and sounds. But she's also communicating non-verbally for many different reasons. Not just, you know, like I'm imitating your action to be, 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 but the baby's sad. Is that okay? What should I do when I'm sad? Like you can almost see that she's about to ask a question. It is those functions of communication that fuel language at all. We need to see that early and we need to notice it. Is she imitating sounds and words and actions, like pushing the car, going like, why she's beating the horn and she's doing her little crybaby thing and all that? We're noticing that this interaction is fueling her language development and that she's meeting indicators of not just, uh, you know, using uh, ritualized words, but using a wide range of gestures and facial expressions. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm to push you to another situation here. We probably didn't notice him. He's 36 months old. A little boy sitting just a bit to her left. Oftentimes, when you have a child in a group like that, you spend so much time with her because she's so engaging that we miss young, this young man right here. He's actually literally 18 months older than her. But because of the way we structure some of our infant head park start programs, he's in the same group. And I'm so glad he is, but okay. Everything about this group is a good match for him. Um, but let's take a look at him now. But he's got a higher age band. We have to look at three to four year old age man, and say, is he understanding and using multi-word combinations? Like, this Jack, or Jack, can you pass me a book? Teacher Jack, pass me a book. Um, understanding and using grammar. Why is grammar important? Things like possessives and tense. It allows you to communicate your thoughts about the present and the past. Also to be able to request a break for a soothing item when distressed. It's getting a little bit stressed at circle time. Can he request a hold of book and, and, and make him feel better? Is he using self-talk to talk himself between first we read meals on the book and then we read the silly book about grandma and her and her milk? Um, and can we recognize and describe the emotions of oneself and others? These are some of the emotional regulation indicators of language development for a 36 month old. Let's see how he's doing. And one of the things you may notice as you watch is he looks a lot like the young lady. Like he actually has a lot of what she has, but we have to keep in mind he's 18 months older. We have a different expectation for his brain development at this point. We want to see more um, from, from him. I literally cut her out so you would be paying attention. Like she hears his words, she 
he's being responsive to every little thing he's doing so that we can enhance his language development. When we noticed him, the team got together and we noticed a few things, things that you might not have noticed in this video, but right there it says requesting a break, um, right here, and it's super nice. And in between those two activities, I don't know if you noticed, but the second one he had a book in his hand, he reached and said, book, book, book. He asked for the word book so that he can hold something, because sitting there not holding something was too hard for him. He used language to ask for a coping strategy. Yeah, like hitting out the park right now. This is $50, I'm like freaking out about that. Um, and, and she gave it to him too, which is like, you know, there's an amazing support for him. But we, we did notice there were some things that we're not noticing and using emotion words, using language to talk through the steps of activities, understanding and using grammar, not yet, not yet. Um, and what does that mean? It means that Jack is now much more noticing, uh, kind of responsive to that. She's modeling a lot more for him. And from that moment on, started to look at this list on a daily basis, saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to get you to do this, I'm going to do that. Um, and she kept saying, we know he has language you know, difficulties, and I'm aware of it. it, it am I providing a good environment for him? That's what we're going to shift to next. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> I said, do you see him engaged? Yes. Then you're giving him exactly what he needs. He's engaged. He's going back and forth in communicative exchanges. He's where he needs to be. Which, by the way, only infant head start can do that. A 36 year old month child with a 16 month old child in the same classroom. And I'm like, yes. Um, <laughs> because they're providing good role models for one another. It's really working for them. Uh, when we notice language as a well being indicator, we can use this tool to guide how we model and support language development proactively. It's not just a, it's not a tool necessarily, if you will, to screen and then refer out for additional services. It's about knowing what we can do as interactive partners proactively to support language. He said, well, how about you monitor my engagement? And so I'm going to give you another tool that's in a freely accessible toolkit. Um, how do you know you're providing them with an engaging environment? And this one's called the Social Engagement Ladder, and I see it's just prior to the noticing tool in your toolkit. It's a freely accessible tool you can download from the GetGeorgiaReading.org website. And I'm going to show you a brief video that was put together by the Georgia Public Broadcasting about a five minute instructional video. We have one for infant toddler, we have one for early childhood, elementary, and secondary settings, and how you use an engagement ladder to gauge whether you're creating an environment proactively that's promoting language development, promoting learning and literacy. Um, you can use this tool to measure engagement. So this is just a tease into the infant toddler version. As a speech language pathologist, I am passionate about the relationship between social engagement and the development of language. When a child has the opportunity to interact in positive exchanges with a caregiver, a teacher, or a peer, endorphins are released in the brain and stimulate a child's engagement. While we want our children to develop and learn language, literacy, and academic skills, the truth is, a child first needs to pay attention to us, find the social world interesting, trustworthy, and captivating in order to learn. This engagement is what drives the child to observe us, listen to our words, and learn from our examples and role models. The goal of this video is to introduce how to use the social engagement ladder as a tool to measure engagement in infants and toddlers. There are several other videos that illustrate this tool with children and teens who are in early childhood, elementary, and secondary school settings. The social engagement ladder helps us identify when a child is learning and actively engaged. There are three elements of engagement that guide our observations. In order to reach a level of a three or a four, a child would need to show investment, independence, and initiation. Those scores are consistent with children who are mostly engaged or fully engaged with those in the learning environment. If a child is not yet showing all three of these elements of engagement, this would yield either a zero or no focus, a one for emerging or fleeting, or a two for a partially engaged child. These scores indicate that there are opportunities to enhance engagement. The social engagement ladder is a tool that has been piloted and used across Georgia. Now about 80 school districts across Georgia are using it in their schools, but we just began to use it more in infant head start early childhood settings as well, and now are, are beginning a pilot in a neonatal intensive care unit with very young infants to be able to measure 
is this child, whether they're you know, literally two weeks old or 17 years old, is this child invested, independent, and initiating? These are called the three eyes of engagement. If you've seen all three, then it's very likely that this child is engaged and developing their language and learning and growing. So first we need to see a learner's investment. That can be seen by noticing like alertness, shared attention, interest, as you can see across the chronological stage from infants, early childhood, into adolescence. We tend to be more invested when we're connected with our caregivers, and our caregivers are figuring ways to get us pumped and into the why of the interaction. In this early childhood setting, we were monitoring one child, we'll see him with a blue and a white shirt um, down over here, making sure that he was mostly engaged. We wanted to make sure he was invested, independent, and initiating. So let's look at the investment of all these children. Are they paying attention to their teacher? Are they connected? Do they find this joyful in some way? She's just read We're Going on a Bear Hunt, and so she's bringing it to life for them. I'm so sorry. Every child has a voice even when they don't have a voice yet. 
Um, she did this so naturally. What was so beautiful about that video and those opportunities was that I was the only one watching. I had stolen another teacher from across the hallway to come in to watch Miss Ivy so we can sit back and notice what she does to engage her learners so we can steal a little bit from her. We can notice that she's bringing those hands-on materials in, that she's calling out their individual students' names. I don't know if you noticed that by the end, they're literally all sitting in her lap, too, and the like the oxytocin cocktails are just flying. Um, that whole program down there, Enrichment Child Services, big shout out. Um, it was amazing. I felt like I could smell the oxytocin. <laughs> <laughs> She's here. She's here. She's here. She's here. Amazing classrooms, amazing relationships, connections abound. Um, as we go to the final part of this, which is the part that you're going to be challenged with, is how do we do this? How do we take the why language development is so important and it should be seen as a well-being indicator, the what, which is using engagement to gauge whether or not we're creating environments that promote language development and then also to find opportunities when they are there, how do we, can, how do we carry it out proactively? And the quote that we have here, I'm sorry, um, is that it's a little hard for me to read there, but I'll turn it here. It's basically we need to start using a more appreciative inquiry approach where we notice what is already working in our communities and how we can do more of that. And when I say our communities, that's a big picture. I also mean like if you're, if you're mentoring a family or a parent, talk to that parent about what they're already doing that's working so that they can do more of that. Build from what's working and mentor each other. And so what we're going to hope we all do is employ practices and policies for language as a well-being indicator. Let's create opportunities proactively before we have academic failure, before we have behavior challenges and poor mental health, for caregivers, uh, educators, healthcare providers to be um, to, to mentor each other to proactively advance engagement in language development. And I'm going to share with you one pilot uh, opportunity we have with families in just a moment. But if you think about Baldwin County, and there's at least several of the principals here, um, in which we've gone into the Hills Academy, we've got the Early Learning Center, we've gone into your programs, and we've got your teachers mentoring each other, if not your instructional coaches mentoring your teachers, in a way that's appreciative. But we sit back and observe what is that parent, that caregiver, that health educator, whoever is interacting with that child doing that seems to already be promoting engagement. And then ask that teacher where they see opportunities and collaborate with them. But constantly be talking about engagement. We've got that rolling in Baldwin County, we've got it going, the early childhood programs in Richmond County, we've got Joe Jolie here. Um, so we're doing that in many different programs. This is an example of one of a father being called out in a positive way for what he's doing to fuel investment in his child. I notice that when you, you know, use the same physical game with your child, it disappears to support his investment. In terms of independence, we're going to, we have a project starting up, starting up in Hamilton, Georgia, where we're going to go into the NICU and we're going to help nurses and social workers and caregivers in those environments help those babies. Um, we're going to start by noticing what they're already doing that's fueling engagement with our babies. I noticed your routine of wrapping the child in a swaddle and using the same words and phrases seems to support his independence of knowing what to expect at this time. He's about to be picked up. He's arching his back. He's getting ready. He's knowing about the world. This is a part of his language development. And we can start this very early. We also notice, um, you know, when we go into early childhood programs, what teachers might be doing. I notice that when you pause after every page of a story, that that seems to support your learners' initiations. By noticing what each of us is already doing to feel language development, we're going to do more of it. We're going to feel more empowered to make a change, to grow a very beautiful flower. We use appreciative inquiry, and I want to begin to start challenging us how much of this mentorship can we do? In schools, we already do mentorship from teachers to teachers. But it's not always used in this appreciative inquiry kind of way. Sometimes we have teachers um, who have to deal with this. They come around, people are doing evaluations, checklists, you didn't do this well, you didn't do this well. That's not going to fuel engagement. <laughs> um, we need our teachers to be lifted up and we need to appreciate them. We need to do that with our early childhood providers, our infant head, our head start teachers. And we need to do that with parents of very young children. And so, yes, we're starting in the NICU programs. But we actually piloted a program where we took core connected families, families where there was vulnerability and risk, 
and we proactively mentor them. We did this kind of a pandemic, you know, like, how do we do that? We basically, we had mom, mom and dad send a video of them interacting with the baby, and then we had the social worker who was connected to them through the case coordinator mentor them and say, I noticed that when you did this, it fueled their investment, their independence and initiation of your child. And I have a, a brief interview to share with you of these parents and their reaction to this kind of mentorship that came to them. They didn't know what to expect. Here's what their reaction was. And she moved to do things like that. I mean, always have to make a face and smile. I would always do it back to her. And I always just thought that was like a fun game that me and her would do together until we started having these sessions. And I realized that, hey, that's actually helping her. And till this day, if I start making face at her or doing something, she knows what time it is. She knows what the game is. She does the same. That he made right there, where he said, I thought it was just a fun thing I was doing with him, and then these sessions were coming, and I was I learned that, that I was really helping her, that I was just making silly noises with my baby. I didn't know that I was growing her brain. You can bet that that, that father right there kept doing it, and he kept doing it more and more and more whenever he could because he was inspired by a social worker who was mentoring him to do that. Several months later, again, they, they get more and more empowered. Um, using appreciative inquiry, we see empowerment, we see engagement. Same parents and then reflecting on, that, on their overall knowledge base. Felt very supported and we also felt more educated, uh, had way more knowledge. Yeah, well, um, really well. yeah, and we didn't feel judged. It wasn't, um, when we would share personal things, uh, just for the benefit of our daughter to learn new things, we never felt bashed or ashamed or hey, you're doing this wrong, it was more like, would you like to learn how to approach different things or see how you can do, um, you know, something different maybe. And so it was very, um, it was a good experience and I recommend it to anybody with working with children, your own children, um, you know, I think it was very beneficial to me and to learn. There's so much power in knowledge. So, especially when it comes to babies, there's power and knowledge. This was a, a, a mom and a dad in a, in, a, in a vulnerable situation with a baby that we knew had a two-thirds risk of going into school without language development. We knew that, so let's start at two months of age. Carry that on until that baby's first birthday. By the end of that baby's first birthday, you hear parents, I know what to do, I'm knowledgeable. I know how to engage with my baby. And they felt connected with her and they felt empowered by it. Um, it, it, it just, like, I don't know, it makes me, like, wild inside, <laughs> knowing that I did that. And I, you know, I, basically, what did I do? I mentored a social worker who does this with many, many different families. So now she's empowered with a tool to mentor proactively. This is not a service they had been providing. They would typically go when there was a referral, there was an abuse situation or something like that. This is where you would go in. That is not going to help this child. Um, we need proactive support and empowerment to the families. So, did I not do well? Right? Well, I thought. Um, so, um, so I'm, I'm excited right now. You've got amazing people out here. People are very familiar with social emotional engagement, knowledge, and skills, which is social emotional piece of some of those tools that are in here. Um, this toolkit, you've got the Baldwin County team over there, you've got Richmond County, CSRA, Central Savannah River Area Risa was actually supported by the Deal Center to pilot this toolkit with Emanuel County Head Start, as well as a pre-K program at Hornsby Elementary in Richmond County. And the impact on those teachers was remarkable. Like, I just have to tell you that they shared out that they would watch children and notice what they're doing and then realize that they are that powerful. As educators, it was really empowering to them. So you have some questions that you're going to be talking about here, or you have questions for me right now. I'm going to feel some facility in that. Okay, great. Can we give it up for Evelyn Rebecca? Um, I'm going to introduce you, by the way, my name is Jen Graham, and I'm the founder and CEO of Inclusive. And I will be your host and MC for the remainder of the summit. Um, thrilled to be here and to witness Emily in action again. Um, really, it's been profound to follow your journey and to continue to see the work that you're doing. So I'd love to open it up to the floor for any questions. I will go ahead and come to you. We'll use the mic there for Emily. But if you have a question, please raise your hand. We have about nine minutes. Um, thank you, Nick. Oh, 
for those who didn't hear that question, it's one that's a very important one, is how do we help our pediatric you know, medical providers, whether it's a pediatrician, the nurse practitioners, those nurses, for example, in the NICU um, that, that we're going to be working with, recognize and understand their role in imparting proactively the importance of engagement. I'm not just checking on their height, their weight, their, you know, like, you know, those kind of factors and saying, here's what you're doing. Um, maybe they'll ask a question about screen time these days, but they're not asking the proactive question, how often do you sit down and have little back and forth communicative exchanges with your child? And that's because language developmental checklists, the more traditional ones from the language development by age family, not in your right now, are different. They just simply say, does the child have a single word? Does the child use two word combinations? They're just checklists. They don't make you think. <laughs> you know, they don't make you think, like, is this child actually engaging back and forth in interaction? So another big question that as, that's here, what can we do to change practices and policies among pediatric welfare visits? While the parent is interacting with their child, we could be noticing language development by age man. We could be saying, I notice that when you are going back and forth with your child right there, that that seems to be fueling their engagement. Did you know that engagement fuels language development and really educate using those five to ten minute period of time that they have for doing those things? Um, and so it's definitely on our list. We have our first hospital that we're going to be working with, and that's right now we think that we have NATO intensive care, but we can go from there. Um, what we're going to be helping is those nurse practitioners that work with children who are at severe risk, they're born premature. Um, we have to recognize there's a brain developing in there, and that brain needs engagement. Um, and while they need safety and they need to be alive, which is one of the number one factors there, we need to make sure that that connection and that bond is happening. What a beautiful question, though. Thank you. I'm not really answering questions, but throwing them back out of you. <laughs> we have our last question over here. Thank you, Dr. Marin. So my question is, how does language development intersect with personality development? Thinking like introvert, extrovert, or even actually such as self-confidence. What a beautiful question. So the question of, of um, how does language development and this and all the concepts I've been sharing have to do with personality development, things like introverts and extroverts and and different factors like that. Um, and I think that language is a way for children to be able to show their true personality and that oftentimes that the, the, the reserve that we're seeing in children may actually be misinterpreted as introversion, but they don't have tools to be able to communicate. When you use the engagement ladder in early childhood or elementary or in home environments, um, you do not need to be verbal in order to get a three or a four. And so, um, and you also don't get to be in a large group. And so we need to think about how do we help all children initiate, invest, be independent. And so we think about like, you know, pairing your kids up into pairs of two, maybe if they're in their classroom, giving them multimodal ways of communicate. They can point to things, hold up a visual, they don't have to verbalize. If we give children multiple ways of communicating, giving them multiple situations to engage, we start to see that children who are more likely to engage in a smaller group situation will flourish in those situations. Um, and so we're not trying to change that, but we're making sure that every child has the opportunity to be engaged, if that makes sense. Um, thank you so much, Emily, for being here and for sharing your knowledge with everyone. We're going to take the next 40 ish, 45 minutes to have an inclusive dialogue at your table and hopefully have a lot of oxytocin cocktails happening. Maybe <laughs> not six pack, but we'll get there. Um, and the way this will work is that it follows a simple model of just one host. So we have um, my 